This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. It is great to be with you. And this is the podcast where we're not afraid to get a little bit into the weeds on uh, aspects of economics and economic theory, and in particular, Austrian economics. And we have been talking a lot about uh, various books by Hazlitt and Mises and Bamberwerk and uh, Hayek, and we've been going through some of these books. And as mentioned on an earlier show, we are soon going to embark on a lengthy multi-podcast episode analysis of human action. We're going to have a really good time walking through that book, and it's going to be an excellent opportunity for those of you who maybe have read portions of it or are a little frightened or put off by its size uh, to to roll up your sleeves and make the commitment to actually reading it slowly. And I think that uh, you'll find Mises is somebody worth reckoning with and someone who will broaden your mind and expand your horizons because it's, it's a book that I think... Uh, anyone who wants to be at least semi-serious about their knowledge of economics needs to tackle. That said, uh, we are pleased to join, at least on the new format, for the first time, our great friend, Dr. Bob Murphy. So, Bob, great to talk to you this morning. Great to talk to you, Jeff. And yeah, let me just echo, for those who are really into Austrian economics, that yeah, reading Mises' Human Action is, is something you got to do. And it's his, the language is a little bit tricky at first, but once you understand how he writes, it's actually not that hard. So I, I would encourage people to definitely listen to, to the Jeff series on that. Well, what's interesting, Bob, about that book is that a lot of liberal arts majors my, like myself actually enjoy part one of that book the most, whereas most people, I think a lot of professional economists, don't like the first part of that book. That's their least favorite part. Yeah, I, and I'm embarrassed to admit, I think possibly you know, 15 years ago, I might have told an economics major, oh, just, you know, if... If you need to skip the beginning part where he's just talking about, you know, much more like philosophy, just get into the meat of it and you'll, you know, you'll get the quick payoff. And and now, yeah, as you say, Jeff, I, I realize, no, some of the stuff he does in the beginning is really foundational. And that's perhaps, you know, the most important thing he does in that book. So, so yes, I, I agree with you that it, I, I know like philosophy majors tell me their favorite part of human action <laughs> is the first part. Well, <clears throat> at any rate, you know, what you won't find in that book is a single equation or chart Right. So uh, when Mises was derided or criticized as a literary economist, that's why. There are a lot of words in that book, Bob. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I want to talk about understanding this negative interest rate phenomenon, because I think it's really important for our audience to get a, an idea of where this is coming from, how and why. And hopefully uh, you will recall, good listener, that a few episodes back, we had Dr. Jeffrey Herbner, and we talked about interest rates. We went into Bomberwerk, and we laid out some various theories of interest rates and, and tried to understand and grapple with where Austrians came down on all of this as sort of a time preference uh, ratio. So first and foremost, Bob, let's think about that. Uh, t- take the classical economists, for example. They had this idea of interest rates represent some sort of meeting of the minds, some sort of return on capital. And that's a book that's used uh, in their their positive theory of interest. So why would interest rates ever be negative if they represent a return on your capital? I don't get it. Right. And that's that's a great question. And um, yeah, and, and actually, just for listeners who go read some of the classical stuff, there was – Depending on how far back you go, there they would tend to use the word profit sometimes also to mean what we nowadays would mean as like an interest return on your invested capital, and and so that you know that that was a thing that came later the distinction between profit and what we would call interest, and so so just people should keep that in mind that um you know there's the, there's that element, and you even see it in modern accounting that what like what an accountant would refer to as as a profit you, you know with net income of the firm that. Uh, revenue is above expenses, you know, we would say, oh, yeah, but most of that is just interest. It's not really pure economic profit. So that distinction, you know, came came later in terms of economic theory. Um, but but you're right. It, it is problematic. And I should say, Jeff, before we observed it with our own eyes, economists, and I would have been included in this, would have said just matter of factly that you can't have negative nominal interest rates, right? So nominal meaning like the actual money amounts being paid, not adjusting for changes in, in prices or the real interest rate. 
And the, the logic was pretty simple. Like, why would you, you had $100, why would you lend it to somebody if he was going to give you $99 next year? Wouldn't you just sit on it? And so that, yeah, that's, and, and so I, I think the, the explanation of, of what's going on, at least, you know, the standard view is that because growth prospects are so meager right now and because there's so much uncertainty, the lot of investors would be willing you know, to, to give up a hundred thousand dollars now in exchange for nine ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine next year, guarantee or you know not guaranteed is there's no literal guarantee, but pledged by a very reputable institution, and and so that's why we'll see. You know, the actual rates that are negative, they're not very negative, right? That it's uh, I think zero point five negative zero point five percent is the the most negative in terms of the ECB. So it's not very negative because people could just go to cash. But when you walk through the logistics of it and say, well, yeah, if you were going to have hundreds of thousands in actual currency, you'd have to get insurance on that. You know, you'd have to put it in a vault somewhere. So there are expenses. And I, and I think that's what's what's driving this. And so you're you're right, Jeff, that it's in terms of saying, oh, I'm how much am I being paid for the use of my capital? It's not so much. I guess it's just supply and demand that the way things are right now in, in um, Europe and Japan, it's the the investment prospects are so bleak that if you really want to have something that's fairly safe, actually you're willing to pay somebody else to guarantee you that purchasing power down the road. But the way things are is because of central bank and treasury interventions, correct? In other words, this isn't the market per se. Right. So that would be my, yeah. So it, everything I've set up till now, I think most mainstream economists and Austrians would would endorse. And so, yeah, now at this point is where our, our ways differ. So yes, I personally think, and I think probably most Austrians do as well, that what we're seeing is like the logical absurdity of Keynesian macro policy, right? And according to the Keynes, well, what do you do when there's a sluggish economy? Well, you push interest rates down. And so you can imagine 10 years ago as a reductio ad absurdum if Austrians said, okay, well, what if you push them down to zero and it still doesn't work? And then a Keynes, you know, would you make them go negative? Ha ha. And probably most people would say, well, no, that would never be an issue. And now we are actually seeing that. And so, so you're right. To me, this shows the futility and the absurdity and the bankruptcy intellectually of, of the Keynesian approach. And, and you're right, Jeff. I mean, I mean certainly... I would say, you know, the reason economies are in a bad situation is because of the boom bust cycle that previous rounds of monetary intervention have fostered. So the very, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite confident in saying that, that in other words, if we had had a free market and money and banking for the last 30 years, we wouldn't be in this situation where, you know, it, the growth prospects are so abysmal that some investors are willing to tolerate nominal negative, slightly negative rates. Um, and also, too, I mean, it's it's funny as people are saying, oh, no, this is just the market. This is how bad things are. It has nothing to do with central bank interventions. It's like, well, then how come all the central bank balance sheets are so bloated? You know what I mean? Like, it, in other words, I would take these that perspective more seriously. The people who are saying, nope, it's just the, the natural interest rate, the, you know, the rate that clears the markets happens to be slightly negative now. Get used to it. And, and central banks are just passively reflecting you know, reality, because that because, again, Jeff, that's what a lot of mainstream people are saying. Now, I would take that view more seriously if central bank balance sheets were like they were in 2007. But of course, they're not. They're they're you know, they've multiplied greatly. It's not just the Fed, but all, all the other banks, as, the central banks as well. So it's, it's pretty to me, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. Central banks were cutting interest rates and they were injecting unprecedented amounts of base money into the system. And so if you want to say, why are interest rates so low? I would say, well, because they're doing what the textbook said they were supposed to do. They pumped in a bunch of money and it pushed down interest rates. So that's the classical or even the Keynesian look at interest rates. What about the Marxists, Bob? They say, well, look, the capitalist has capital and he loans it to the poor proletarian worker. And the worker has to pay back the capital and interest. And that interest is exploitative. He's taking that excess from the workers, uh, the sweat of the worker's brow. But if interest rates are negative, I don't understand how that gels with the whole Marxist conception of interest rates. Yeah, that's a great observation. And I had, so I personally hadn't even thought of that until you just brought it up. Well, you you mentioned it, you gave me a little warning <laughs> to have my wheels going before we started recording. But yeah, I had not thought of that. So you're right, just to recap for the listener, 
in the standard Marxist view, the the explanation of what's the source of interest. And again, if you go look it up, they might have called it profit because, you know, in the classical mindset, profit just meant, you know, w- w- the difference between revenues and explicit monetary expenses. So that would include what we nowadays classify as the portion that just goes for interest on the invested capital. Um, that, yeah, they the idea was the capitalists are the ones with the funds, you know, they can afford to wait. And so, whereas the workers are on the, the verge of starvation all the time. And so the, the capitalists have all the bargaining power. And so even if the workers collectively at a factory produce a million dollars worth of stuff, then, you know, the capitalists can afford to just pay them nine hundred thousand dollars in wages because, again, they, they have all the bargaining power. And the workers, you know, they, they accept it because they have to because they got to feed their families. So, and so then that hundred thousand dollar gap is due to just the the Marxist exploitation that, you know, the capitalists, the, the surplus, they skim off the top um, from exploiting the workers, from underpaying the workers, the true value of their of their product. And so that's that's the standard view. And just incidentally, that was one of Bumbavrik's most damning, decisive critiques of the Marxist approach was to point out and said, OK, if that theory of where interest comes from is correct, then empirically we should see industries that are more capital intensive. They should have um, versus ones that are more labor intensive. You should see a difference in the, the rate of return on capital. Right. If you, if you have a business that's mostly just hiring workers, then that should have a higher rate of exploitation or rate of surplus than one that's just paying, you know, for machines, right? Because if capitalists are just buying machines from other capitalists, there's no source for exploitation. It's the systematic underpaying of wages that's the source of it. So again, other things equal, if there's an industry that's very labor intensive, like, you know, like haircutting, let's say, you know, capitalists who open up a bunch of hair salons and most of your expenses are just paying wages to the hairdressers, the rate of return on your invested capital there should be a lot higher than in something like offshore oil drilling, where most of the money you spend up front as the capitalist is not hiring the workers, but, you know, buying all the equipment and everything to go drilling and set up the, the rig and so forth. And yet, empirically, of course, that's not what you see. Competition sh- ensures that the rate of return on invested capital is roughly equalized, at least, you know, taking account risk across industries. So that was one of Bambavrik's, you know, most damning critiques, and, and Marx never really solved that problem. So as far as nowadays, I confess, Jeff, I haven't seen what... My guess is Marxists would point to this and say this is the failure of capitalism, right? The, the internal logic of capitalism, it always needs to expand to you know, find more markets and grind down profit margins. And this is the, you know, sows the seeds of its own destruction. And, you know, we see now that returns have actually been driven negative, And this is what Marx predicted. I'm, I'm guessing that's how they would handle it. But in terms of according to their own theory, does this make any sense? No, it really doesn't because it, it would mean that the capitalists – are paying workers more than the value of their product, which seems kind of silly. You know, couldn't the capitalists just refrain from doing that? Well, Bob, but the alternative here is maybe, just maybe, today, what's today? It is September 23rd, 2019. Maybe today is the day that Jeff Deist, non-economist, actually added a little tidbit to economic thought. Hmm? Could that possibly be the explanation? I certainly would be happy yeah, for that know. for you if that were the case. Uh, well, and I can, yeah, like I said, I, you, you thought of that and I hadn't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if other economists hadn't thought of, it, but yeah, I've not seen anyone ask what, you know, what, how does this, you know, how does a Marxist reconcile this? So again, I'm virtually, I would be willing to bet a lot of money. The Marxists are not going to say, you know what? Turns out we were wrong. Yeah. That everybody interprets current events and say, yep, we just nailed it. Every, you know, everyone says that Keynesian Chicago school Austrians. But let's be fair. If, if in mm-hmm. any way that na- negative interest rates could occur in, in a naturally occurring market, I don't think that's the case, but maybe I'm wrong. If they could, that's a challenge to Austrian interest theory too, because the whole concept of time preference uh, doesn't make sense if interest rates are negative. Well, well here, so I, I don't want to speak for, for all Austrians, but I don't know if you and Jeff Herbner got into this, but Walter Block, for example, has this article it's just talking about, you know, it's, I think it's called Negative Interest Rates, colon, a taxonomic critique, where he's, mm-hmm. you know, going, uh, so giving a taxonomy and saying these are the different things. So, for example, it the, the pure time preference theory of interest is based on the, the fundamental premise that present goods are preferred to future goods other things equal and so you, know, exactly. you come up with with cases where oh well what if it's uh you know in the beginning of june and someone says do you want fireworks now or do you want them next month on july 4th 
And so if somebody says, I want them on July 4th, that's not a violation of time preference because other things aren't equal. So likewise here, when you when you get into it and you say, okay, even if it were occurring in the marketplace, you know, like if there were going to be a huge famine predicted next year, you know, and it was because of natural causes, and you know, so the you'd still want to have free market capitalism as the best social mechanism for humans to deal with this impending famine, you know, because again, maybe like something just changes in the soil or whatever. There's a, a an asteroid hits Earth and kicks up dust, and sunlight can't get through or whatever. Um, still, you could imagine a situation where because we predict that crop yields are going to be so low next year that people right now are willing to give up. 100 bushels of wheat today in exchange for 50 bushels next year. So in a sense, that's a negative 50% real rate of interest. That wouldn't be a violation of time preference because Austrians would just say other things aren't equal. So likewise here, so I, you know, as we said, I think the reason we're seeing these negative interest rates is because of central bank manipulation. But even if it weren't, you could come up with some crazy scenario. I think the standard Austrian view would just be to say, okay, it's not that there's negative time preference, it's that there's these other circumstances and these really aren't the same goods that are being you know, exchanged across time. So, Bob, just to put the brakes on this a little bit, give us an Austrian definition of what we would call originary interest rates, which I kind of think of as, as naturally occurring in the marketplace. Right. And um, so the, the way it's, it's often used is the originary interest rate uh, is the rate that you would see. So... If, it's the it's the gap between what entrepreneurs pay for the means of production, including hiring labor today, versus what they expect those factors of production are going to yield in revenue down the road. So you spend a hundred thousand dollars on materials and hiring workers and so on to build a house today, and then one year later you sell it for one hundred and ten thousand dollars. You know the originary rate of interest there was ten percent, so you're getting a ten percent return on your money. And notice you're not going to the formal loan market, not you know the market for loanable funds. So that's something that's been in the Austrian tradition at least since Bombavirk, is to say that the interest rate is is not determined in the explicit lending and borrowing of of cash, but rather it's you know it's, it sort of emanates it's, it's from the whole time market as it were and that yes because of arbitrage it's it's going to be equal if people are literally just you know in the bond market borrowing funds, sums of money but it's it just it permeates the whole mar- marketplace so that that gap between what do you pay for the means of production and then what do you expect you're going to get you know from their their product is the originary rate of interest and that will be so and some people use the phrase natural to mean the the rate that uh, is consistent with the fundamentals, if I if I could use language like that. So, um, the central, you know, the Austrian view of the business cycle and what Mises said, the banks can manipulate the market rate of interest and push it temporarily below the natural rate or what the originary rate would be in a totally free market, and that's what sets up the unsustainable boom. But would that originary rate in a free market always be positive? So, so here I. I think so. As you may know, Jeff, my dissertation, I actually criticized some of the Austrian usages. I think they use terminology a little bit inconsistently here. So I think you could probably find passages where both things happen. So in other words, it's some some Austrians would say, you know, in some usages, they would say, no, it can't. Meaning like because because they're saying the natural interest rate just reflects the rate of time preference. Mm -hmm. And since time preference has to be positive, meaning other things equal, people prefer present goods to future goods it would make no sense. Whereas if what you mean is the actual observed market rate of exchange, yeah, like I said, in theory, you could imagine some crazy scenario where there's going to be a flood next year or something and and that present goods officially looking at the market rates appear to be trading at a, at a discount to future goods. But that's, you know, like I said, Walter Block or Mises would say, okay, that's not, they're not really the same goods. So it, again, it just depends. What what do you mean? If, if you're, adjusting and saying we mean other things held equal, then yeah, you couldn't have a negative interest rate because that doesn't make any sense. But here's the hang up for a lot of people who think uh, like us or have read Austrian content is that, let's say in previous recessions, the central banks had more room to work. Let's say interest rates were 6%. Mm -hmm. So they cut them four points to 2%. That's a dramatic decrease. And that's, you know, in an attempt to gin up the economy. So we can understand that conceptually. We might say that central banks shouldn't do that, but we can understand it. But when we say central banks take interest rates, the same four points from 2% to negative 
because of this cons- this idea I have in my head that interest rates have to be positive or they don't make sense, that, that becomes just a lot more difficult conceptually, even though it's the same four percentage point rate cut. She, in other words, is going from zero to negative, is this really going off a cliff? Is this really something that is conceptually different, that is unprecedented, that is historically different, that doesn't make sense economically, fiscally, monetarily? Or, or is should we be thinking about it less dramatically than I am? Well, I, so one big difference that, yes, it is a qualitative different thing is this issue of the fact that we're talking about nominal rates. And so so you're right that normally – when we're like in the Austrian theory of the business cycle, yes, it just has to do with, well, what was the market clearing interest rate supposed to be? And then if they push it down, that's the wrong price. And so that, you know, when entrepreneurs are calculating the present discounted value of future cash flows, they're plugging in the wrong number and that screws everything up. And that's what gives the unsustainable boom. So, so yes, if, if that's the angle you're looking at in principle, the zero point really shouldn't be that big of a deal. It's just a matter of the deviation of the, you know, the actual rate from what the correct rate ought to be. And that's, you know, the, the extent of the distortion. But here, I, th- I think you're right. The, the reason there's something extra weird going on is that, um, again, this issue of you, you can always go to cash. And so that's why even mainstream economists, before they saw this happen with their own eyes, would have said confidently, you can't have negative nominal rates, right? So, so normally when we're talking, when economists are talking about interest rates, especially in the context of guiding production and investment decisions, they usually mean real rates of interest, right? So that if you were in a in a world where prices were rising rapidly, the nominal rate of interest would be higher just to adjust for the fact that the dollars you're getting paid the loan back with are weaker than the ones you lent out originally. And so the economists usually kind of just take that for granted and they're not even talking about that. And so that's what's weird about this case. It's not merely that the real rate of interest is negative, where you know the purchasing power you're getting paid back with is less than what you lent out. It's that the actual nominal rate is negative. And again, that seems weird because why wouldn't you just sit on the cash? And so I, I think th- that's the thing that's you know an extra layer of weirdness, if you will, here and that economists have to grapple with. And and so and it, this goes hand in hand, by the way, and this might be one of the reasons for it. I don't you know, I can't get in the heads of the central bankers, but in order to, if they, if they wanted to push n- rates even more negative, they have to get rid of cash. And so I think that's partly what's going on here is the drive to eliminate cash. Now, in addition to saying, well, you know, criminals use it and there's tax evasion and that's why it'd be good to go to an electronic cashless society. Now they can also say, and they have been saying this, I'm not putting words in their mouth, I've seen people argue and say, oh, well, really, we ought to have negative 1.2% interest rates, but we can't because, alas, people have the option of going to cash. Whereas if we could just get rid of cash, now you, you you can't go to cash, and no matter where you're storing your money, they can just ding you with the negative interest rate. And so I think those you know those two things in practice go hand in hand, and it, it does underscore how weird this is, that the only way to maintain very negative nominal rates is if people can't hold cash. Well, and remember, just a couple of weeks ago, Alan Greenspan said that negative rates are probably coming to the U.S. and it's not a big deal. And you know, institutional investors and central banks are one thing, but individuals, when you say hold cash, not so simple. Let's say your your Vanguard or your TD Ameritrade money market was going to go negative, and you said, "Oh my gosh, I don't want to participate in this," and, and I've got two hundred and ten thousand uh, dollars in it. Good luck going down to uh, you know getting a check. From, from Vanguard or TD Ameritrade, and good luck going down to your local bank branch and getting physical cash um, f- for that. If you don't trust banks, in other words, obviously you could just deposit the money and leave it in your local savings, you know, your bank savings account or, or whatever. But, uh, you know, get actual physical cash, it's very simple to pull, let's say, $100 bills out of the economy. The, the uh, Treasury could just issue an edict and have uh, banks and car dealerships and other, uh, uh, you know, Walmart pull hundreds out uh, and submit them. And then everyone would just have 20s. And so the idea that you can just sit on cash, well, I guess you can sit on it in an account. But it's not, you know, if you don't trust uh, the, the bank itself or if you're above FDIC limits or whatever it might be, uh, th- there, there is not the physical cash in the economy to satisfy everyone's desires for this. I think if we really got aggressively into negative interest rates, either in Europe or the U.S., this is no joke, Bob. Oh, yeah. So I agree with everything you just said. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me just make sure in case some of the listeners were misunderstanding. So colloquially, a lot of times we say, 
Like, oh, yeah, he got spooked. And so he, he, you know, that investor went to cash or, you know, some some portfolio manager got nervous. And so he went to cash. He put his clients in cash in that context. What it means is, yeah, they they sold off stocks and they got and they got into a money market fund or something. So but when I what I was been taught, what I've been talking about in this episode is the reason economists historically would have said you can't have negative nominal interest rates is that, yeah, the investor would literally just hold currency, like actually physically hold hundred dollar bills or you know euros or whatever and and so now when we say well then geez how come it is that institutional investors in europe are tolerating a zero negative 0.5 percent rate of return and the answer is just what you're saying that it's it's cumbersome that in practice what it means so yeah you wouldn't put it in the bank because the commercial bank also is paying negative rates on checking accounts what you would do is you actually take out currency and put it in a safe deposit box just like you know you could put earrings in or necklaces or you could put actual currency in there and hold it with a bank but there's storage costs right just like you can't hold jewelry in a safe deposit box for free so likewise here if you wanted to hold a bunch of money that way you could do it and you could say well i'll hold it at my house but then there's a chance there's a fire or you know burglary so that's that's why you know that's mechanically how is it possible that investors are tolerating these slightly negative rates and and i'm saying but but notice the rates aren't that negative because yeah if it were like negative ten percent more people would do exactly what we're talking about here you know literally pull out currency and so you're right that the authorities to get ahead of that and to pave the way for possibly even more negative rates are instituting measures like you say to try to you know phase out or at least I've seen academic discussions of this to say ultimately right now the the thing that's constraining is the reason we can't get back to full employment. The reason we're stuck in, stuck in this secular stagnation is because of this technical limit that the central bank has its hands tied. It can't make interest rates go to like negative 3%, even though that's what they should be, according to our Keynesian model, because too many investors will just literally pull out currency and sit on it. And so that's why, ah, if we could just go to a cashless society or move towards it, you know, like you say, suck out $100 bills and just leave smaller bills there to make change and stuff, then investors would have no choice but to tolerate these negative rates. And so that so the two go hand in hand. And, and my my guess is it's possible partly the drive for negative interest rates is because they realize this will be a justification for taking out cash, which I think, you know, there's other ulterior motives for. Well, you might a cynic might call it a haircut, right? <laughs> yeah. And and the other thing I've seen is that people have likened this, well, you full reserve Roth Barty and say that well, banking should be warehousing. And so if you're just keeping a bunch of cash, uh, they're charging you uh, a warehousing fee because, as you said, it's safer in the bank potentially than in your house because of fire or theft or whatever. I'm not sure it's safer in the bank, by the way. But I don't think this this analogy works because, first of all, we're not talking about physical cash. We're talking about just an account, which is electronic blips. So that that actually costs the bank very little or Vanguard or your money market or whomever as a, as a matter. Now, they might allow you some online banking services that, in fact, you know, do cost some money and that, you know, you might reasonably be expected to pay for that. But I think when we're when we're not talking about physically warehousing cash, you know, you go back to Rothbard's idea of a of a demand deposit versus a time deposit, which I, if I recall, he talks about in what has government done to our money. And you say if it's a pure demand deposit and they're warehousing it for you, it 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 makes sense for them to charge you a few points to hold it and safeguard it. But I don't think that's really what's happening here. I think this is this is just a desire to force people into electronic rather than physical. And then force them to take a haircut. And so, you know, the question becomes, Bob, who's buying this stuff? Europe, there's $13 trillion worth of both sovereign and corporate debt out there that's yielding negative right now. And that's about 40%, 40% of Eurozone uh, bonds, if you took a pool of bonds, of Eurozone bonds. And so I think, as you referenced earlier, I think this is basically institutional investors. Uh, and I think... We should point out, this isn't a bunch of individuals, mom and pops, who are saying, OK, I'm going to go out and buy this negative yielding corporate debt in company X, Euro European company X. Now, this, there are some people doing this, but not very many individuals. And even though it's yielding negative uh, 1%, I think it's going to, you know, it's got pretty soon interest rates are going to be even lower. So the bond itself is going to be worth more because there's an inverse relationship between a bond price and its yield. Uh, so I'm actually not I, – I, it's not the interest that concerns me. It's I'm making a, a capital investment for a capital gain. And so I think interest rates are going to go even lower and I'm going to sell this bond for more than I paid for. That's a very different consideration than interest 
uh, positive or negative. So two different things, interest income and capital gains income. And, and of course, the flip side of all that, Bob, is it <laughs> if interest rates go higher, if they rise, which I think a, a lot of Austrians think that they will have to over time, then that $13 trillion that's currently uh, yielding negative, there's going to be huge losses. I mean, people are going to be wiped out or institutions are going to be wiped out if they're holding enough of this. Yeah, those are all, all good points. And you're right, just quickly on the Rothbard stuff. And, and this is another observation that you that you made, Jeff, that I heard from you before others. So yeah, J- Joe Weisenthal recently had been toying with, the, you know, on his Twitter account, and then he wrote it up for, I can't remember, if it was, I think it was Bloomberg, where he was saying, you know, why is everyone freaking out about negative interest rates? You know, why do we assume that the that institutions are going to store our wealth for us for free? Like, why wouldn't we have to pay him a charge for that? And that's what negative. And so I think he was a little bit confused conceptually. But then you pointed out, Jeff, and I, you know, and I worked into the Mises Wire article I wrote on this stuff, saying, well, yeah, actually, Rothbardians have been saying in general, you know, for the use of a checking account. Why, if, if you wanted it to be 100% reserves, and that's what Rothbardians think a, a genuine checking account demand deposit should be, you would pay a slight fee to the bank for the you know the privilege of using your money and them having ATMs all over the country and check clearing services. So there's a lot that goes into a bank you know keeping money in your checking account for your use. It's not really just them holding it somewhere at a particular branch. The way if you had a safe deposit box with your grandma's earrings in them. You know, you can't go around at an ATM and get earrings shooting out, right? So it's actually a, a, a fundamentally different thing. And and I also agree, Jeff, that yeah, what's going on here is is not that. I mean, certainly these the people who are paying or who are absorbing negative interest charges, it's not because they have a hundred percent. The banks have a hundred percent reserves, and and so ah, oh, it's because my money is so safe now. That that's not what's driving this. Um, and and yeah, it's. I, this situation it's genuinely unprecedented. So I think a lot of economists who are talking like, "Oh yeah, this is standard, and don't worry about this," and 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 we know there's no there's no problem from this stuff. I, I think they're bluffing. They they have to be because yeah, we we've never been in a situation like this. And you're right. If interest rates move up, it's going to be devastating to many institu- institutional investors in terms of capital losses and central banks as well. I, I mean, there was I haven't done the numbers recently, but uh, a few years ago. I had been following some analysts who were just doing rough back of the envelope calculations, just showing things like if U.S. Treasuries rise one point, then the Fed's insolvent, you know, stuff like that. So, again, I don't know what the number is right now, but just showing how screwed up the whole situation is with these very low interest rates and people loading up on debt. And then, yeah, if the interest rates rise, just the capital losses are going to cause massive uh, insolvencies, even among central banks. So it's not that the central bank's going to shut its doors. They can just print money or you know create electronically. But in terms of just causing a panic, it would be weird if all of a sudden, for example, the Federal Reserve's uh, assets fell significantly and it technically you know, it was insolvent. That, m- that might cause people to try to get out of the dollar. Well, and let's not forget that central banks have the most important client of all, and that's the states uh, in, in which they are located. So if we look at governments that have – national governments that have a lot of debt relative to GDP, you look at Japan, you look at certain countries in Western Europe, increasingly you look at the US. And so if I'm correct, last year interest on the national debt was uh, under $400 billion, uh, line item in the U.S. in Congress's annual budget, it was three hundred and fifty billion, something like that, and that's with relatively low interest rates. Although there's a lot of debt out there that's long term, and it's, and you know, so there's sort of a blend of interest rates across outstanding treasuries. But nonetheless, let's say interest rates went from, you know, one point seven five percent to his, just historical averages like five percent. Uh, all of a sudden, Congress, the single biggest line item in their annual budget would be debt service, not Medicare, not Social Security, not so-called defense. So I don't know that we can ever go back. I don't know that governments I'll, – I'll tell you what, Bob. A Fed chair who raised rates to 5% would, would find himself or herself pretty unpopular with Congress pretty fast. Right, and that, that's a great point you made. I, I think what happened partly – so I'm going to mention Obama, but of course, you know, Trump is is doing it as well. I was in favor of the corporate tax cut. I just wish they had cut spending or at least, you know, kept it constant rather than uh, spending, you know, letting ex- spending growth uh, occur as well. But yeah, under the, in the Obama administration, there were four years in a row where they had a trillion dollar plus budget deficit. 
right? Borrowing more than most countries' entire GDP is. And yet that, you know, that didn't, that wasn't a problem. Interest rates didn't blow up. And, and so what happened there is that, that huge surge in debt occurred at the same time that the Fed was doing all this QE stuff and pushing interest rates down, at least, you know, according to our view of what was going on. And so I think that masked it. So the analogy I was using at the time was saying it's like when you're running up credit card debt as a household, but you keep getting the offers in the mail for 0% APR balance transfers. And so you can be running up the debt and living way above your means. And as long as you keep getting those offers in the mail and rolling over onto a new card at 0%, it doesn't hurt that much. In fact, you're like, this is great. We're getting, you know, a new car. We're going out to dinner. This is awesome. You know, everyone, why is everyone worried about, you know, having a family budget meeting? This is fine. But of course, once you stop getting those offers, once your debt gets so big that the credit card companies realize, yeah, let's not lend this person any money. We got to start getting paid and it reverts to the normal interest rate, then that's when the catastrophe hits. And so I think likewise here that, the yes, the U.S. federal government has been running up huge debt, particularly since the financial crisis. But the reason it doesn't feel that burdensome is that interest rates to service that debt fell during the same exact period. So, yes, we're not talking about a crisis where, oh, it goes up to double digit rates like it did in the late 70s, early 80s. Just like you say, if it just goes back to even approaching normal, quote, normal levels like in 2005, that's game over. That all of a sudden, yeah, it, it just to service the debt would, you know, they'd have to cut all sorts of other programs just to contain the debt from mushrooming quickly out of control. And that's, and that's partly too, like if you look at like the CBO's estimates of long term spending, there's a huge mismatch and it's things like Medicare, but also, yeah, they're building in very modest assumptions about interest rates gently rising over time. And so debt service just becomes enormous just from standard, you know, treasury yields rising slightly over as they keep rolling over the accumulated debt as the existing bonds mature and they got to go in the market and borrow again. So if, if interest rates rise a little bit more quickly than the CBO forecast thinks they will, again, that's all of a sudden hundreds of billions extra in year a year expense that they weren't counting on. Well, I think we also shouldn't forget that the Fed has been out there buying up treasuries. It has stood as a backstop against all this. So that's, uh, you know, apart from its machinations of the Fed funds rate, there, there's a reason why treasuries have arisen. I would argue that if you looked at the United States as a, as a clear-eyed investor and said, this is, as a corporation, this, is, this place is never going to get its fiscal house in order. Look at how much they, they spend above and beyond what they tax every year. And they do this year after year after year. They've built up $23 trillion in debt. And their political situation, they've got all these geriatric people and their entitlements are going to expand. They're going to be spending way more on Social Security and Medicare. They're never, ever going to get their fiscal house in order, ever. They, they go all around the world fighting these wars and borrowing. It, the, the place is insane. So if I'm going to invest in that place, I want junk bond rates. I mean, that's the way I think about it. So I don't understand how – I understand that the rest of the world to an extent, not as much as our own institutional things like Social Security Fund, but the rest of the world also owns treasuries. So at some point, this this isn't good for them, I think. Right. And what you just said is exactly where I was looking at it and as, <laughs> as people who know my career know – I famously was wrong in, in predicting that CPI was going to rise more rapidly than it than it did because, yeah, I was just think I didn't see any end game to this. And I thought investors around the world were going to look at it just as you did and, and say, you know, maybe give them a year or two just to see. But once it became clear that, you know, their, their solution is every time there's a downturn, they're just going to print more money. Why would you want to hold dollars in that, in that sort of environment? Because, yes, if you hold bonds, it, it might be that the – you know, U.S. government slash Federal Reserve acting as a sing single unified entity just create more dollars to pay you off so they're not formally defaulting on the outstanding bonds, but those dollars then you're getting paid back with are clearly less valuable than what you would have thought originally when you bought the bond. And so, yeah, I I am amazed that the central banks and governments of the world have have maintained this and that they can have such low interest rates, especially now that the Fed is loosening again even though unemployment, according to official measures, is at like a 50-year low. Like, that, that's amazing to me that they're, they're showing, yeah, we got to start cutting rates, and, and they've started buying bonds again. If you look at the total Fed assets, they had been shrinking for like the last, I don't know, 18 months or something, 
gently, like they were letting them roll off a little bit, and now they just spiked again the last couple of weeks since the Fed just changed course. And so you're you're right, Jeff, that it's to me, I don't see how investors like what do they think's going to happen? That and as you say, it's certainly not that. Oh yeah, this Trump administration's an aberration, and we're going to get adults in the room who are going to be serious about reforming entitlements after 2020. That's clearly not. I mean, all the Democratic candidates that are out doing each other, saying how much, how many trillions they're going to spend on a Green New Deal and Medicare for all. So I I really am surprised. And the standard explanation is, oh well, it's the you know the the cleanest shirt in the in the pack or whatever, meaning. Europe's house is so messed up also that people go to the dollar, but you don't need to go to sovereign treasury, you know, or, you know, you can go to gold or Bitcoin or whatever. And in fairness, you do see some of that, right? That you gold is, is higher now than it was in 2005 and so on. But I am surprised that, yes, that institutionally so many investors seem to actually believe governments and central banks that they're not going to let price inflation get out of hand down the road. Well, and there's an artificial market for U.S. Treasuries, I think, thanks to our friends in the ECB, right? At least Treasuries yield positive interest. Yeah. However low, I mean, compared to minus. So I'm sure a lot of money flows into Treasuries just because of that. Yeah. So ex- certainly on the margin to say, you know, wouldn't money flow or yes, why would investors, given that you were going to buy institutional uh, or, or, or sovereign debt, what EC, what the ECB is doing would make you switch over to U.S. Treasuries. I mean, that's certainly true. But again, just saying, well, who's to say? And, and part of this too is is that there's regulatory requirements, right? With you know the Basel Accords and, and things like that, where certain financial institutions have to hold capital requirements reserve, you know, of of a certain category. And so maybe there's that sense in which the authorities are kind of forcing people, hey, if you're going to do business, you got to hold a bunch of sovereign debt. So, so that might be partly what's keeping the lid on this. But still, it, it it does surprise me how much they've pumped in and how much debt governments have run up. And yet interest rates, you know, yields on, on government debt are still this low. That I'm, I'm surprised at how long this, what to me seems like an unsustainable pyramid scheme. I'm surprised how big they've blown this thing up. Well, I want to get back to your mentioning CPI and what happened and didn't happen after the crash. You know, it wasn't that long before the crash that the, that the U.S. monetary base, and base money is the narrowest uh, definition or narrowest example of the money supply. So generally, as Austrians, we say, oh my gosh, if the money supply grows faster than goods and services in the economy, you know, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. So base money is basically the currency in circulation plus commercial bank reserves at the Fed. So not that long ago, uh, in the mid-2000s, that was only about $500 billion. And after all those rounds of QE, after Ben Bernanke and then later Janet Yellen went into hyperdrive after the crash of 07 and 08, that amount got up to four, up over $4 trillion. So basically – uh, 8x. So think of think of quad, excuse me, quadrupling. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 8x the the monetary base. So it went from well under a trillion to over four trillion. Uh, so here's what I don't understand, Bob. If you can just do that, is that meaningless? Uh, I'm sure our, our listeners understand that banks don't lend reserves. That money is just to to meet their reserve requirements. It's literally parked at the Fed. Uh, in the in the old days, they used to borrow from each other overnight uh, to because they they weren't as flush with reserves as they are now, at least until a week or so ago. Uh, and there, that's hence the Fed funds rate is the rate at which these banks borrow from one another overnight. But but since 2008, they've been getting paid interest on excess reserve, so they've had an incentive to just leave that money parked. So the, the so there's this this monetary base, which which is the narrowest understanding of the money supply. It, it, it multiplied many times over. So because it's not lent out, it's not just general money and credit out there sloshing around in the economy, making a Honda Accord double in price. So can, can this really be done forever and ever without any pain? I mean, I don't get it. What, when does it eventually affect the broader economy and CPI, and or, and has it already affected the broader economy? Has it moved money into, let's say, uh, fancy housing in certain markets and into equities, uh, you know, into the stock markets? Uh, well, h- help us understand the the monetary base and why people like Krugman say expanding it doesn't matter. Sure. So with this stuff again, I I just do want to acknowledge that what I said in 2010, for example, looking at this 
was off. And so <laughs> this is with the benefit of hindsight that I'm now going to offer these remarks. Be just be my assessment at the time of what the different factors and how they were going to play out was 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 wrong. And and so here, the stuff I'm going to say, you know, is is true individually, but in terms of how these factors inter interact with each other, you know, it's 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 uh, it's Bob, hard to know. Bob, but it takes a big man to admit he was wrong, <laughs> and it takes an even bigger man to never ever ever be wrong. Yeah, like Trump. <laughs> um, so, so there's a, several things going on. So one thing is, and, and you you touched on a lot of these things just as, as you were setting up the question. So one thing is. But when the feds start doing all that QE, you did see prices rise, but it was in asset markets, right? And and that's not like a conspiracy theory. That was the whole point. You know, part of what the Fed was doing was saying, oh, gee, we want to, you know, cause a wealth effect. And, you know, so you saw the S&P 500 index or whatever, you know, shoot up even when the Fed would make an announcement. And so there, the, and if you think about it, there is a certain logic there that, yeah, when the Fed's pumping money in, it's investors and the, the the fat cats who are the ones who are going to go and, and you know benefit from it immediately. Another thing, as you say, is the Fed in October of 2008, right? So like the month after Lehman and AIG and all that stuff, they, st they instituted a new policy of paying interest on reserves. And so that's partly what on the margin made commercial banks less willing to use those new reserves as the basis for then advancing more loans to regular people. And so there's that element as well. Um, and also I've seen people point out like, you know, the, the boom in fracking, for example, you know, U S oil output went up by about 50% from your mid two thousands to now. And so it's possible in a normal economy or absent the fed pumping and all that money, you would have seen the price of oil come way down. And so gasoline would have been much cheaper. And so the fact that gasoline prices, you know, didn't move that much, might have been actually, you know, yes, there was price inflation and in in energy costs relative to what otherwise would have happened because of all these innovations in the private sector, right? So there's there's things like that you could say, and what you know, with uh, all the innovations in, in inventory management and so on, it's it's possible that you know, say, hey, how come I didn't see prices rise ten percent? It's possible they did rise relative to things that you know, trends that were already in place that you know, the the Fed's monetary inflation masked um, what otherwise would have been price deflation for consumers because of all those innovations. So there a lot of things like that going on. Now, the, the Keynesian, just to be clear, they're going to say, no, you guys are totally wrong. Your approach is wrong because when interest, when nominal interest rates are close to zero, treasuries and, and currency are virtually the same asset. So a lot of Keynesians were saying the, the Fed's QE program, it's not really doing much to stimulate. And that's what they may mean by like a liquidity trap, or that's, that's part of what goes along with that. They're saying... When nominal rates are zero percent, if you you know, in other words, if you have a treasury bond that pays zero percent, or you have currency just sitting around, those are kind of the same thing. And so, by the Fed coming in and buying treasuries in exchange for cash, wasn't really doing anything. It was almost swapping assets that were nearly identical. So I don't endorse that view, but I'm, I am just saying that's the way some people were interpreting it. And so that's why the Keynesians were saying these QE programs they might help a little bit, but they're actually not doing too much because they're kind of swapping assets. So in normal times, that's not true, but when interest rates are basically zero, they're saying cash and treasuries are kind of the same thing. So those are different ways of looking at it. But but yeah, you're, you're right, Jeff. I So it, it, all of this, to me, it's like we're in an unstable equilibrium, like a, like a picture of marble at the top of a very steep hill, where if it doesn't move one way or the other, it's okay. But if it just moves a little bit, then things unravel really quickly. And to me, that's where we are, that if... If price inflation did start rising, everything would unra unravel very quickly. And so it's like, can we just can central banks just keep pumping in money indefinitely just to keep pumping up the monetary base? I wouldn't think so. But again, I'm surprised they pushed it up this far already. So, Bob, after all this QE, leaving all these American commercial banks flush with reserves at the Fed, we still have this crisis a week or so ago where a repo overnight lending between the banks themselves, and there's usually a delta between the Fed funds rate and the overnight repo rate between banks. All of a sudden, some banks had solvency issues. I mean, what's, what, what's the point of all this QE <laughs> if, if we still have banks with solvency, overnight solvency issues? Yeah, so you're, I think you're exactly right on that issue that, again, this is to me showing the reductio ad absurd. Are you kidding me? After all this stuff, and even – because remember – 
like the way when Bernanke was on 60 Minutes and they were saying, gee, is this going to cause hyperinflation? And he was like, no, no, these are just temporary measures. As soon as the economy recovers, we're going to, you know, we have an exit strategy. We're going to let out, we're going to unwind all these programs. So to me, that's what's so amazing is that, yes, eventually the, the Fed, you know, they did taper for a while. They were just treading water and holding their total assets, rolling them over. And then they even started letting them roll off a little bit. But then they reverse course when officially on paper, the U.S. economy is fine. Right. Again, so we as Austrians think there's problems that those official numbers are masking. But in terms of the establishment economist, it's odd that they, they have to do all these emergency interventions when unemployment's 4% and the price inflation, according to them, is fine. So, yes, that is weird that the, the, the patient of the economy, as it were, is still basically needing life support 10 years after they started doing all these extraordinary measures. Like it's it, it is interesting to show, according to even to their own logic, clearly these programs have not done too much, have they? Um, as far as what was the specific reasons for the flare-up, I think one big thing going on is that there were, there are capital requirements. So the um, the requirements from Basel and things like that that some of these banks are having to satisfy is a separate issue from just their reserve requirements. And and so that's, I think, partly what was going on here. The lives institutions, yes, they're fine vis-a-vis their reserve requirements, but some of them were not fine uh, in terms of their uh, requirements because of capital considerations, and that's why some of them were short and rushing into it. And then and people were saying stuff too, like, oh, well, they had, the corporations had to pay their tax bills and stuff. But, I mean, I'm sure on the margin those were contributing factors, but it's you know that's not something people didn't know about. I mean, people know when tax bills are due. And so I, I think there is something going on in it. In it, it it's like the, the attitude of, oh, nothing to see here, don't worry about it. I don't think adds up like to me, the fact that, yes, they had to do these interventions days, you know, multiple days in a row is showing that the Fed is losing control of some of these key interest rates and that the Fed's not omnipotent and just showing you how tenuous their grip is on this. I think a lot of this is like a self-fulfilling prophecy that the reason investors think, oh, yeah, I guess we can keep buying treasuries and so on. And we're tolerating these low yields is because they think the Fed ultimately can just come in and is a backstop. But at some point. It's like the Fed can be a backstop until investors stop thinking it can, and then it can't. So it's kind of this weird psychology thing where just just like you know the housing bubble, if everybody keeps thinking housing prices are going to go up, they're going to keep going up. And so what makes that change? Well, it's hard to pinpoint, but at some point when people start getting nervous and they you know they start selling, then all of a sudden there's an avalanche and it unravels really fast. Well, to wrap this up, I just wonder if this is the new normal. In other words, this idea of ultra low or even negative interest rates central banks, including our own Fed, creating lots and lots of liquidity. Is this just how it's going to be forever? Because it wasn't that long ago, Bob, I, I want to say 2011, uh, Fed officials at like the Dallas Fed, for example, were saying, you know, uh, after the crisis, we expect the Fed's balance sheet to return to pre-crisis levels. And that, of course, we now know that that's never going to happen. So is, is this just how it is now? So you're right that the way the Fed was calming investors after the you know right after these QE programs went in is they were assuring them yeah this is just a temporary injection of emergency medicine as it were once the patient recovers we'll withdraw the medicine and go back to normal and so that you know don't don't worry when you see Glenn Beck on his show you know having a forklift and showing the monetary base which I don't know if you saw that Jeff but you know Glenn Beck <laughs> was doing that at like late 2008 and so yes people were freaking out about all these injections of liquidity and the Fed officials don't worry we're gonna suck it all out before prices start rising don't worry. And now, yes, they have officially changed their stance and they are telling people we are going to permanently have a much higher balance sheet indefinitely than we did before the financial crisis. So they have officially changed their tune. A lot of account like Larry Summers and people like that are pushing this secular stagnation thesis saying, yep, this is the new normal because of demographics and blah, blah, blah. That in, in the unwillingness of governments to run large budget deficits, that, yep, this is this is very meager growth going forward as far as the eye can see. That's that's the issue that, that you know, that's the new normal T- to me. I I can't see how it's going to continue indefinitely like this. They can't just keep printing more money because you would think at some point investors more and more of them will start getting out of you know these low yields and into something else. And, and again, it's 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 like saying we're in an unsustainable bubble. And then when someone says, well, what would make it stop? I mean, it's hard to pinpoint, but you just know if it by definition, if you're saying it's an unsustainable bubble, it means it is going to stop. But it's hard to say when. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a fascinating topic, and I'm afraid it's one that's going to hit close to home for all of us, and we need to understand it. I'm going to put a little pressure on Bob here and say that, uh, you know, a lot of us have a difficulty conceptualizing and understanding the actual mechanics of how central banks operate, how they create money, uh, how commercial banks then go and create credit, how bank reserves work, uh, all of these sort of technical and mechanical elements to uh, the the interplay between central and commercial banks is difficult for people who are not necessarily uh, well schooled or versed in in those mechanics. So uh, Bob is going to write some articles for us, a series of articles on Fed mechanics uh, that you should all be looking for in the near future because it's it's something where I think if we're going to be uh, pr- proposing things, if we're going to be making assertions, if we are going to be saying that these uh, these de- dead uh, economists from the 1800s were right and the Bernanke's and the Yellens and the Greenspans and the Draghi's are wrong, uh, we need to be knowledgeable and informed and able to, to back up those arguments. So uh, Bob will look forward to that. Uh, be sure to check out Bob's great books, including Contra Krugman and, of course, Choice, which is really a, an excellent, uh, uh, I won't say substitute for human action, but an excellent uh, way to look at human action, which we mentioned earlier on the podcast. So uh, stay tuned for more human action podcasts. And please uh, thank Bob for being our guest this week. Thanks for having me, Jeff. It was a pleasure. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.